you mentioned just in passing, teenage girls, if they have a free Saturday afternoon, they like to walk around in the shopping mall rather than going to the library. So I found that very thought-provoking because I think that many people, and I would have to include myself, uh, believe that deep, deep down, what we all really want is material comfort for ourselves. That this is what we all want more than anything else. We, we, we may make an effort and go to the library. We may make an effort and uh, vote. We may make an effort and uh, go to work or even visit a sick friend or say a friendly word to someone who is in trouble. But what we really would like to do is sit on a big comfortable sofa and watch a, an entertaining program on a big, beautiful television set and maybe have somebody bring us some uh, hot fudge sundaes or bonbons while we're watching the program, that this is what people, what I'm really like, <laughs> what, what everyone is really like. Selfish, and, and really seeking material comfort, and that that is human nature, that is bedrock human nature. And I think a lot of our political attitudes come from the fact that we think we can never get away from that. That's what we are. Now, do you share that view? Not in the least. <laughs> and, and I think there's plenty of evidence against it. There is, has been a massive effort for over a hundred years to try to convince people that that's what we are. It's called advertising. Now there's a, it's a huge industry. It's dedicated explicitly, openly to trying to, you read the business press a hundred years ago and it's taking off to uh, uh, try to direct people to the superficial things of life like fashionable consumption. Get them out of our hair by getting them involved in consumption. And huge efforts go into this. Uh, for example, about 20 or 30 years ago, the advertising industry realized that there's a sector of the population that they're not reaching because they don't have money, known as children. So, and some bright guys figured, well, we can get around this. The children don't have money, but their parents do. So what we have to do is direct television programs for children and so on to uh, try to induce what's called nagging. Try to get the, this is literally the case, create nagging propaganda. And by now, if you look at academic um, uh, applied psychology departments, there are actually programs studying different kinds of nagging and how you can induce it. And if you watch children's television, I've seen this with my grandchildren, as two-year-old kids are looking at things and they're being uh, induced to try to get your parents to get me this thing or else I'm going to die, you know, and so on. And, and then the parents get it and you throw it away in five minutes. But every aspect of our life is de devoted to this. Actually, my wife and I went, were taken by a friend a couple weeks ago to see a... Uh, what do you call it, the, the, the baseball, you know, the preparation, the pre-season baseball. Spring, Spring, Spring training. training, right. And you take a look at the stadium, every inch is covered with an ad. I mean, I remember the first baseball game I went to was in the 1930s. There were no ads anywhere. Now every inch is an ad. Every taxi cab you look at is an ad. Every minute of your life is inundated with efforts to turn you into the kind of person you're describing. So is that human nature? Uh, I don't think so. So take a look at these Trump voters again. See these working class people in uh, 
uh, say, rural towns, which manufacturing towns in Arkansas, and take a listen to what they're saying. Uh, these are people who, men who want to work in coal mines, which is not fun, rather than to take a government handout. They don't want to sit on the couch and being given a government handout. That undermines their sense of dignity, of self-worth, of doing something significant. Uh, and I think that's what people are. Uh, you go back further, there's plenty of evidence for it. There's, uh, there's a, a wonderful study, a huge study, of the reading habits of the British working class in the late 19th century. Jonathan Rose, very detailed study. What were British workers reading? turns out they were better educated than, uh, than the aristocrats. Uh, Amer in, say, eastern Massachusetts, Boston, where I live, uh, the, uh, an Irish blacksmith, if he could make enough money, would hire a boy to read to him while he's working. I mean, I can remember this from childhood in the 1930s. Uh, most of my family were for Im immigrants, you know, first first generation uh, unemployed working class, they were quite educated. Many of them didn't go to school, you know, maybe fourth grade, but they read, they went to concerts, uh, uh, they went to Shakespeare plays, they talked about it, they were interested in politics. Uh, I mean, I think it's taken huge efforts to try to drive all of this out of people's heads. I think the natural thing for humans is to want to be independent, creative, uh, uh, whether creative, I mean, maybe you work on a, uh, you know, uh, fixing up co uh, old cars in your garage on the weekend instead of sitting and watching television, whatever it may be. You want to do something that's significant, that's worth, that's worthwhile, maybe even if it's a ugly, horrible job like working in a coal mine instead of taking a government handout. Because people, I think, want a dignity and a sense of self-worth and a sense of cr creating and doing something important. That's what we are. And I think it's taken huge efforts, enormous efforts. A uh, huge part of the economy is devoted to trying to drive these things out of people's heads to make you think that all you want is more commodities. And so you should go shopping instead of reading, let's see. So that people... Most people, by this account, really have been uh, uh, unnaturally squashed into being something much, much smaller than they could be or than they should be. And want to be. And want to be. In fact, it's pretty interesting to go back to, uh, there's good studies of the working class press in the early Industrial Revolution. Um, in the United St or England, it's earlier. In the United States, it would be uh, mid 19th century, late 19th century. There's a very lively working class press. A lot of it written by young women, uh, young women from the farms, called factory girls, who ran their own newspapers. And uh, the material, it, there's a lot of material on it. And it's pretty interesting. Uh, the, what they wanted was dignity. They hated the industrial system because it was turning, the, it was destroying their rights as independent people. Uh, they attacked what sometimes they called the uh, idea, the slogan, they denounced the slogan, gain wealth forgetting all but self. In other words, the kind of person that you think we all are, that we're taught we all are. That's what they were condemning. We don't want to just gain wealth forgetting all but self. We want dignified, independent lives. Uh, they regarded wage labor as uh, not very different from slavery, which was just a popular idea that was a slogan of the Republican Party, literally Abraham Lincoln and so on, because it takes, you're selling yourself if you're a wage laborer. If you sell something you created, let's say you're an artisan and you make something and you sell it, you're not selling yourself. If you sell your labor, you're selling yourself. You're losing your dignity and independence. It's an attack on your fundamental rights. These are themes that run right through the spontaneous uh, productions of mostly uneducated working class, what we call uneducated working class people. It was the same in England before us. I think it's the same elsewhere. I just don't think people are... It's, you, know, you talk about human nature. I think we're talking about something that's 
constructed and contrived with enormous effort, conscious effort. Uh, you look at uh, in, in the television industry, uh, there's what's called content and fill in a program. Uh, content is the ads. The fill is the car chase that you pull off the shelf to keep people watching between the ads. And if you just watch television, you can see that the creativity, the thought, the uh, funding and so on is going into the ads, uh, not into the fill. You know. In the newspaper industry, there's what they call the news hole. So you lay out the newspaper. First you get all the ads. That's what matters. Then there's this news <laughs> hole where you put in things to keep people watching. I mean, uh, this is literally hundreds of millions of dollars a year. A huge part of the economy goes into this. An interesting aspect of this, which is kind of interestingly not studied very much, uh, has to do with uh, basic economics. So anyone who took an economics course or you know reads about it knows that uh, the uh, uh, a market economy is supposed to be based on informed consumers making rational choices. That's what we're taught. Our economy is. Uh, take, turn on the television set and take a look at the content, the ads. Are they trying to create informed consumers making <laughs> rational choices? I mean, if we had a market economy, uh, if there was an ad, it would be an announcement by, say, Ford Motor Company. Uh, here are the characteristics of the cars I'm producing <laughs> next year. Uh, here's what Consumer Review says about them that would create informed consumers making rational choices. That's not what you see. There's huge efforts to try to create irrational consumers, uninformed consumers making irrational choices to undermine market economies yes. and to turn people into uh, people who believe, may even believe that what they want is to sit on a couch and watch television. That's not what they want as yeah. human beings.